Well, welcome everybody. For those of you who are watching this later, I'm Scott McCormick, and today we are continuing our study through the Gospel of John. We've been studying for man, 11 weeks now, 11 or 12, I can't, I've kind of lost count at this point weeks. Um, we have gone through the prologue of John, where we saw a summary of the Gospel, um, as he put it. We've, we've been with John the Baptist as a precursor and a man pointing towards Jesus Christ. And then we've seen the beginning steps here of Jesus' earthly ministry, where he goes to Cana to perform the, his first miracle, turning water into wine. And then he goes down into Jerusalem. And that's where we are parked right now, because we're studying a conversation between Jesus and a man named Nicodemus. So um, ge geographically here, now if y'all will bear with me, I gotta pause the recording and fix my tablet. All right, so before we um, actually go into the lesson for today, I want us to reread together the entire conversation that Jesus has with Nicodemus. That's John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. And we can split that up together and read it. And then there's going to be some other things for us to read too. So I'm going to have three of you read the first few sections here. Then there'll be some other passages. So Claudia... You're, you're not going to be missing out, I promise. Um, yes. Katie, I'm on page 887. We're in John chapter 3. Katie, if you'll read verses 1 through 8. Matt, if you'll read verses 9 through 15. And Lauren, if you'll read for us 16 through 21. Okay. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Nicodemus a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, Nicodemus said to him, what can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does, what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Very good. So Nicodemus and Jesus have a conversation that varies widely in topic. They, they go from the, Jesus's very first statement all the way down there to the end of 21, and it, it turns into this more and more detailed look into what salvation and justification look like. What is the means by which we are made right 
with a holy God, even though we are sinners. And so there's this man here who comes to Jesus. And we, if we remember from um, the previous weeks, we've been looking geographically. This is the Sea of Galilee. We started here at Bethany on the Jordan River. We went up to Cana, down to Capernaum, and then way down here to Jerusalem for the Passover. And this is really great timing for us to kind of be here during the Passover because that's what we're in right now. We're, we're about to celebrate Easter, which is uh, when Jesus' death and resurrection happened during the Passover week. That was why he was in Jerusalem at that time. So this is sort of uh, providential that we're here. Jesus is celebrating the Passover and he's performing signs. And there were many there who believed in his name because of the signs, but he did not entrust himself to them. And then we meet this man named Nicodemus. And this is, uh, this is a man who is in contrast to these other people that Jesus does not entrust himself to. He comes to Jesus, and what do we know about Nicodemus? What, if we do a little review, what do we know about him? He's a Pharisee. He's a Pharisee. What else do we know about him? A ruler of the Jews. I'm sorry, you're, you're quiet. What did you say? Oh, sorry. Um, a ruler of the Jews. A ruler of the Jews. Good. Now, there's another one that's um, in verse, uh, on the next page, verse 10. What does Jesus call him? A teacher of Israel. You are the teacher, the teacher of Israel. Now, who remembers what a Pharisee is? What is a Pharisee? They were a sect of the Jews who cared very deeply about the details of the law. They were very rules oriented. Very good. They were Works um, righteousness oriented, I guess I should say. Yeah. And so there was another sect called the Sadducees. And what's the big difference between these two groups, Pharisees versus Sadducees? Who remembers? There was something the Sadducees did not believe in. In the resurrection? That's no. right. They didn't believe in the resurrection from the dead. And so as a result, if there's no resurrection from the dead, then there's no... Uh, really spiritual world and the afterlife, so there's no angels either. Doctrinally, they only believed in the first five books of the Bible, what we call the Pentateuch, or uh, these are the books that Moses is credited with having written. We've got, um, if, if we were in Awana, I don't know if you guys have ever worked with toddlers at church um, or early elementary schoolers, but they used to have to remember, they had memorized the books of the Bible, and it was fun to listen to their pronunciation. So it was, it was Genesis, Explodus, um, uh, Leviticals, Deuteronomy, and Numbers with, with no R, Numbers. Those are the first five books of the Bible in Awana as we memorize them. And the Pharisees, on the other hand, were experts in the law. They, they, they chased after a um, experts in the law. They chased after a personal righteousness to be attained by fulfilling the law, something that no human can actually do. It was always this ever higher goal that you can't meet, that you break one of the, the laws uh, as written in the Bible, and it says that you're guilty of all as a result. And so um, Nicodemus coming to Jesus with these concerns and questions would not have come from the Sadducees. This was a very materialistic temporal group. Um, they were more the politicians in the Sanhedrin. The Pharisees were more the teachers and the experts in the law. And it even says that he's the teacher of Israel. This points to a specific position within the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of the Jews, that there were some higher positions in the body that were more political, but one of those was more of an advisory or teaching role that his job was to be an expert in all things scripture. And, and that sort of leads to uh, where we are today. He's having a conversation with Jesus, and 
he comes to him not even with a question, but just admitting that Jesus is a rabbi. We know that you're a teacher come from God because you've been doing these things. And Jesus, right out of the gate, changes subject. And he either sees what's really on Nicodemus's heart, or he changes the subject to be what he wants to talk about. In either case, he makes a statement. And what is this necessary conditional statement that he makes to Nicodemus in verse 4? In verse 4? You mean in verse 3? Thank you. In verse 3. It unless works better if I look at my Bible and then I get it. It's okay. Right. Unless you're born again, you cannot see this kingdom of God. Right. So he says, you must be born again. And this, this phrase, born again, if we'll remember in the Greek, it's, in, it's intentionally ambiguous. It can also be interpreted born from above. And here, this tells us two things. It's a, a, it's a second birth. Your first birth doesn't cut it. B, it is a spiritual birth. This is something that has to come down to you. It's not something that you can do on your own with your physical body. And being born again is the necessary condition to see the kingdom of God. And I want to pause here. We, we touched on this briefly last week, but I had a conversation with um, a friend from church after I taught this at, at, um, in the church class. And he, we were talking specifically about witnessing to somebody. If I go to somebody and I tell them the gospel and they reject it, what's the deal there? You know, I, this, is, this is good news, and they're saying, I don't want that. And one of the things that we have to remember here is that in our natural state, in our first birth, in our flesh, we are under spiritual blindness. This means that we cannot see or understand or comprehend the spiritual things. That there's, there's something in us that is blinding the eyes of our mind to get it. And so when you go to somebody and explain to them the gospel, you explain to them the bad news, that we're in sin and we're at odds with God, and that he's made a way for us to be made right with him and and to be righteous in his sight. That's the good news. When we try to explain that to somebody who is spiritually blind, it's like explaining color to a blind man. They're not going to get it. They've never seen color. They've never seen anything. And so what do we do with that? Well, A, we need to remember they're not rejecting the gospel because it's not desirous. They're not rejecting the gospel because they don't like you. They're rejecting the gospel because it doesn't make any sense. It's, they're, it's blind, it's, they're blinded to it, so to speak. And how do you get out from under that spiritual blindness? There's something that has to happen to you. And it has to happen from above. It has to come down and act on you. And here's where the good news for us is, that should be encouraging to us, is that the Holy Spirit who does this birthing, that does this quickening in somebody's heart, and changes it from a heart of stone into a heart of flesh, from a dead thing into a live thing, is that the Holy Spirit uses the means and occasion of our presenting the gospel as the way in which he then goes about and enlivens somebody's heart and brings them out of that spiritual darkness and cures their spiritual blindness. And then they see the gospel and go, oh, that makes total sense. I absolutely want that. I, I'm going to be all over that. That's what I want. So as, as you begin to talk to people in your life about the gospel, about who Jesus is and why he came and why it's so critical to choose and to follow him to be made right with God, you'll meet with people that are still under that spiritual blindness. Don't despair. The Holy Spirit does not often use the very first time somebody hears the gospel as the time when he goes in and regenerates them. Sometimes it's the second or the third or the last, it, they could be on their deathbed. If you think about the thief on the cross with Jesus, Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. This man was about to die. And that was the occasion that he was born again. So think about that as you um, go about presenting the gospel to people in your life, telling them about the good news that you know, 
and about what Jesus has done for you, um, be encouraged by that, that, that there, this is the, the time and occasion that the Holy Spirit uses to cure people of this spiritual blindness. So Nicodemus's reaction in verse four is, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And that's where we finished up last week. And I, I wanted to be able for us to read the next few verses all in one go because um, Jesus, Jesus is sort of letting out these little paragraphs to explain to Nicodemus things in chunks. And so Jesus follows up on his first statement with what we see in the remainder of this paragraph. Jesus answers, and I'll, I'll reread this again. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So in that, that first sentence from Jesus, we see that we need to be born again or from above. And then he clarifies it. He adds to it. He explains it more in verse Five, and what does he say you need to be born of? Water and, water and the Spirit. Oh. Water and Spirit. Don't worry, y'all can all unmute and talk over each other. That's perfect. That's what class looks like. Water and Spirit. Now, this is where we get to go, huh? What, what is he talking about here? So, this word water obviously calls to mind the concept of baptism. Now, we've talked a good bit about baptism already. Uh, John the Baptist, we call him John the Baptist or John the Baptizer because he baptized. And it's, it's one thing for us to go, okay, well, I know that Jesus is probably talking about baptism here, but he's talking about water and spirit. Are these two things? Is this one thing? What is he referring to here? So first, I want us to take a look at uh, the concept of baptism and these two ideas. And to do that, let's rewind just a little bit and go back to John chapter 1. Look at a conversation that John the Baptist had with some of the, uh, with some of the Jews. So let's go to John chapter 1. I'll write that on the board up here. And let's start, um, Claudia, it's your turn. If you will read for us John chapter 1, verses 24 through 27. Sure. Um, now they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him, Then why are you baptizing if you're neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. Very good. So here John is having a conversation with these men who have been sent to question him about his identity. And really underlying their questions is this problem of John is baptizing not just Gentiles to become Jewish proselytes, but he's also baptizing Jews as a sign of repentance. This is not something they normally did, so they've come to challenge him about this. And he says, you guys are focusing on the wrong person. He says, I, I baptize with water. There's that word water again in the, concept, in the context of baptism. But among you stands one whom you do not know. So let's get a little bit of clarification on who he's talking about. Let's scroll down just a little bit, still in John chapter 1, and I'll read for us verses 29 through uh, 33. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes 
with the Holy Spirit. So here we see a distinction, even in John's conversation, between what he's doing with water and what Jesus does with the Spirit. There is a baptism by water here for John, and that is of repentance. And then there's a baptism by Jesus of the Holy Spirit, that there's something that happens to you by the Spirit. Here, John, here Jesus is describing it to Nicodemus as being born again of the Spirit. But he's using this word water. So is he talking about, uh, in addition to John's baptism, for me to be born again, do I need to be do I need to receive baptism by water and then also a baptism by the Spirit? Well, to get an even better picture of this and make sure we're, you know, is it the same? Is it separate? Let's now turn to the book of Matthew. So keep a finger in John chapter 3, because we'll be right back, and turn to the first book of the New Testament, the book of Matthew. And my Bible will be in John, Matthew chapter 3. And let's see, Katie and your... We have the same Bible. We're on page 808. 808. In fact, Katie, I think it's your turn to read again. If you'll read um, Matthew chapter 3, verse 7 through 10, and then Matt, if you'll continue that and read 11 through 12. Here, John is again talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees who have come to see his baptism, and he's challenging them about their understanding of these things. So if you'll start on verse 7 there, Katie. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadduc Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, does not bear good fruit, is cut down and thrown, to, thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear the, his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Good. So the picture we see here as he's drawing a, a comparison between what he is doing and what Jesus will do coming after him, he says, I come baptizing with water, but he will come and baptize you with what? The Holy Spirit and fire. Spirit and fire. Well, I, I don't know about you, but I've never gone to a church that said, all right, in order for you to be baptized and proclaim your, your by obedience, pro profess your faith in Christ, we're going to dunk you in a big bath of fire. So clearly, that's not what he's talking about here. Spirit and fire here are given as one unit, that this is a description of what is happening by the Spirit to you. That, that, that When we think of fire, we think of its all-consuming ability to burn up that which is dead and decaying and not of any value. If we think about how gold and other precious metals are refined, they're dipped into the hottest ovens that, that we can make into the very core of the fire so that the, all of the impurities in that metal floats up to the top and we can just scrape it off and it burns away and what's left is what's pure and good. That's what we're talking about when we say being baptized by the spirit and fire. That's what's happening to you. And in the same way, in a similar way, we're talking about being born of water and the Spirit now in John chapter 3. You can go ahead and flip back there. This is describing the cleansing effect of the Spirit in this new birth, that this is not something that's washing away uh, just the outside dirt on your body, but it's a washing that happens to your soul, that your sins are being washed away as a result. So here we're seeing him describe one unit, uh, I think, one unit of being born of water and the Spirit. Now, this is not to say that you shouldn't be baptized by water. That's one of the ordinances or the sacraments um, 
depending on which denomination you might be in. They use different words there, but the meaning here is the same. Jesus says, you're to be, you're to repent, turn back to me, and as a profession of that faith, be baptized uh, in water. But this text doesn't actually point to water baptism. There are many other good texts in scripture that point to that. Here, it's just talking about the cleansing effect of the Spirit. Does that make sense? Is that, is that cool? Now, I have seen other interpretations of this, um, full disclosure, where, for example, maybe they meant by being born of water and the Spirit, maybe the water birth is your first birth because there's some water involved there, and then the Spirit is your second birth. But comparing it to these other passages in Scripture, that doesn't fit as well. So I won't, I won't spend too much time on that. So he goes on um, after that to now refer directly back to the example Nicodemus gives. Nicodemus is having trouble processing this idea of a new birth. And he gives an example in verse 4. How can a man be born when he is old? He says, can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? He's concerned about this man's ability to accomplish this under his own will, under his own strength. We know from John chapter 1 that the second birth is not according to the will of the flesh, not according to the will of man, but of God. It's a sovereign birth. Even when we say born again or born from above, we're talking about something that has to come down to you. It's not something you can reach up and take hold of. So Jesus now refers back to this word picture of an old man. And in verse 6, he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. He says, even if an old man could be born again physically, that wouldn't solve the problem because that would be being born of the flesh. And here, what is required is being born of the spirit. So if I go out into my garden and I plant an okra seed, um, I can't, oh, here's an okra. There we go. It's got spines and a little cap. Okay. And I plant an okra seed. I'm not going to get an onion as a result. There's an onion, it's got little roots on the bottom, okay? And layers, onions have layers, if you've watched Shrek. And if I go out and plant carrot seeds, all right, a, uh, uh, you know, I'm not gonna get peas or beans or whatever, right? I could keep drawing garden pictures here. I need to practice my garden <laughs> pictures, obviously. The thing that is planted, that's what's grown. So in another way, we could also look at this from a species perspective. You can't plant a amoeba and get to the massive amount of genetical information contained in human DNA. You can't get to, from one place to the other. The thing that is sown, that's what grows. He says, the problem here is not a problem of the strength of your flesh. The problem is the spirit has to do it. And until the spirit gives you a new birth, then you, you will not have this spiritual birth that's required to see or to enter the kingdom of God. Now, Nicodemus is growing in his understanding now as he's trying to, you know, wrap his minds around these pictures. And we get a sense in verse 9, if we skip to verse 9, he says, how can these things be? And in verse 4, we sort of get this image of Here's Nicodemus's face, and he's, he kind of looks like this with question marks. And he's going, I have no idea what you're talking about. I am unsure. I'm confused. This is sort of mind-blowing. And then in verse 9, when he says, how can these things be? Now he is he's starting to sort of smirk a little smile. And he's like, you know, I, I haven't gotten this before, but I'm starting to get it. And it, he turns into... It's sort of like this marvel. He's marveling at these truths. He's going, wow. I mean, I guess, yeah. I mean, if I, as I start to think back on what I know about the Old Testament and about what the Bible says about these things, man, I really should have known this. And this is marvelous. And, and, and Jesus says, don't marvel. He says, don't marvel. He says, let me paint another word picture for you. Now, this is where Jesus is so good at packaging up these complex ideas and putting it into ways that we can understand. He paints a picture with a play on words. So in the Greek, the word spirit is written 
as NUMA. And I'm going to really try to capture NUMA here in uh, NUMA. That's in the Greek. So P N E U M A. If you've ever heard of like a pneumatic pump or a pneumatic tire, this is a tire that has air in it or a pump that pushes air. That's where we get those words in English. Pneuma is the word used in Greek for the word spirit. It's also used for the word wind. So Jesus is making an, uh, an intentional play on words to draw now a word picture for what the spirit does and how it goes about doing it. So let's reread this word picture. It's so, it's very short, but we're going to talk about it for a minute. Um, Lauren, I think it's your turn. If you'll reread for us verses seven and eight of John chapter three. Yes. Uh, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Good. So he's now drawing a picture from nature. And in his day, they didn't have meteorologists or, or the study of weather at all. I mean, they noticed weather patterns, but they probably hadn't captured the idea that air and wind is particles and they move around based on different uh, pressures in the atmosphere. And that's influenced by temperature distributions and all of that. And even though we have these concepts today, if you were to walk outside and there's wind blowing by, even the most studied meteorologist can't look up into the air and go, All right, right over there, that's where the wind's coming from. And you wanna know where it's gonna end up? It's gonna be, I tell you what, it's gonna end up right there. That's where it's gonna end up. Nobody can do that. It's still a mystery to us because it's driven by forces outside of our control. And so here he's painting a picture of the wind for Nicodemus that even if you stand there and here comes the wind whooshing by, we can see the effects of the wind, but we do not know where it came from or where it goes. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. I can see the effect, for example, in uh, Matt's life. I can see fruit in his life, how he talks to other people, how he goes about his work. And I can see some evidence of the Spirit working in him but I didn't see it go in there, and he didn't see it and reach out for it himself. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. There's, there's a mystery here, not a mysticism here, but there's an incomprehensibility. Uh, that's a really long word, so I'm going to write it out. Incomprehensible. This doesn't mean that it's um, not understandable. It means that it's, it's something that there's, there's details about which we don't understand. There's concepts involved in how this is working that we can't wrap our finite minds around. There is an incomprehensibility to God. He is so big and so awesome, and there's so many things about him that we can't even express in the human language. So it would be so that much diff, more difficult for us to understand. That's the kind of picture he's painting here. And what he's trying to tell Nicodemus is two things. One is you don't have to understand every facet of how this is working in order for you to trust in it. So like when he says, um, let the little children come to me, you have to have the faith like one of these children in order to believe in me, that's the kind of faith we're talking about. Children believe anything you tell them. My kids, they ask me how something works and I can make up the silliest answer possible. They will totally buy it. And they'll go around and tell everybody that they just learned that, all right? They just trust. They don't know, they just trust. That's the kind of thing that God's looking for in the faith that we have. It's not an uninformed faith. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue to study and learn and understand more but we don't have to fully wrap our minds around it in order to believe it. We can trust in it. That's what we're looking for. The second thing here is that the spirit in this case is an individual. It is a member of the Trinity. It is a person with a will that does things. 
and that will is not driven by us. When we looked at John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, we talked about how the second birth, number one, it's a second birth. It is a spiritual birth. It is a supernatural birth. And when it says of God in verse 13 and in verse John chapter 3, verse, um, verse 3, it says born from above, this is a sovereign birth. This is something that God does. This is not something we reach out for and can take under our own power. We need to pray to God that he will do this work in us. And as a result, it's appropriate for us to pray that he will do this work in the people that we love, the people that we care about, the people that we know to be lost, to be separated from God. God can do this work in them too, and we should pray for that. So that's what he's painting here with this picture of the wind, that there's an incomprehensibility to it, and that's okay. There's a sovereignty to it, and that's good. And either way, we need to put our faith in that and trust in him to be born again. And that wraps up this first bit of his explanation. As we continue our study over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to try to do the next paragraph next week and then finish up this conversation the week after that. Um, we're going to get into really some of the most beautiful, most quoted, and most misunderstood verses in Scripture. I, there's, there are people that have never darkened the door of a church but they know all about John 3.16. Well, that's good. I'm glad. But it's important for us to understand it in the context here of this conversation he's having with Nicodemus so that we can really know what it's talking about. So that's what we're going to continue to study. Thoughts? Questions? Awesome study. Thank you. I'm glad you're here. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry about my um, exit plan and come back. My dog is was going crazy barking at some contractors, so I was on mute. I didn't want you guys to hear that. that that's all right. That's all right. <laughs> really good stuff, especially with the water and the spirit. Yeah, there's, um, I mean, I studied a lot on that this week, and um, two different commentators, and it was neat to see them line up in, in how that works. Um, so that was cool. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll tell you guys, um, I, what I'd like to do um, is after we finish this conversation with Nicodemus, I may take a couple, one or two weeks break just to, just to, to not have the, the continual study, teach, 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 study, teach, teach, teach. I love doing it, but I, I also have like this um, level of stress that I have to manage, and it's important to do that too. So like I've kind of torn, like I don't want to, I don't want to not teach. I don't want us to not have class at the same time. I'd like a little bit of a break. So um, I may do one or two weeks. I just wanted you guys to have a, a heads up that that, that that would be coming. But I'd like to finish out this conversation so we have the full context. And then we're going to get into a lot more fun stuff in the second half of John chapter three. Sure. Cool. Cool. Well, um, before we go. Let's close in prayer, and I'll, I don't always do this, but I'll take volunteers. Would anybody like to volunteer to close us in prayer? Oh, happy to volunteer. Okay. Thank you, Claudia. You're welcome. Father, we thank you so much for your word, and we thank you for Scott and his um, diligence in studying the word and delivering it to us. We just pray a blessing upon him and a refreshing as he starts to think about taking a week or two off, whether that's start next week or, or afterwards, just, just refresh him, Lord, and ease whatever stress that he has in his life. We know often, Lord, when someone steps out to serve you, the enemy wars against them. So, Lord, we just thank you for his life and his family and his marriage and just ask that you um, just bless him with an extra portion for his ability to step out and his willingness to step out for this group. Um, and for to articulate as we lift this company up continually to pray before you to bless it, bless the owners and the executive management and all those that are part of articulate and keep it safe, Lord. 
in this season. I, we just give you praise and thanks to God, Jehovah, um, Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. And we need your peace in this season. We just give you praise and thanks for your only son who came for us, Lord, and offers all mankind a path back to you, Lord, is, is the greatest gift we could ever receive. And we celebrate this weekend. This is our highest holiday in memory of um, the greatest thing that you've ever done for us in the resurrection. So, Lord, we have hope in that. We thank you for that. Um, I just pray a, a hedge of protection on all that are here and family and friends and ask that you bless them and um, with, with the peace of knowing that you're in control and you are still God and on the throne. We give you the praise and we give you the thanks. In Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thanks to each of you for coming. I Thank love you. you. And I'm glad y'all are here. God bless you guys. Happy Thanks, Easter. Yes. Happy Easter. Resurrection Day. Goodbye. Thank Bye. you for everything. Bye. Bye. Bye.